Good morning and welcome to Rich Thoughts for Breakfast. I'm Harold Herring and that's my fine wife, Beth. Before we get into today's teaching, we want to give a special shout out. Yes. <laughs> Somebody very special in our lives. Yes, he is. My dad turns 92 today. Woo! 92. Mama just turned 91. On April 30th. That's right. So. And my dad, let me just briefly tell you, he's uh, the, he's the, in my mind, the greatest individual soul winner I've ever met. Amen. About 700 people he's led to the Lord. And uh, he's also the greatest person I've ever met. And I've met presidents, a lot of celebrities. A lot of great men. But he's the best. Amen. Happy birthday, Pop. Happy birthday, Papa. We're going to pick up where we left off yesterday. Yeah, we left a cliffhanger, <laughs> I like to say. God sets us apart from going to church, praying, even living a righteous life. How does he do that? Well, by our obedience to the scripture. Because Genesis 8, 22, 8, 22 says, as long as the earth remains, there be seed time and harvest. The very first thing listed in Genesis 8, 22 is giving. We started talking about seven reasons we should be a giver, powerful reasons. We're going to do a brief review first. Number one, we worship God by our giving. Psalm 116, 12, 116, 12, classic amplified Bible. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? How can I repay him for all his bountiful dealings? Well, you praise him for all his benefits, realizing that we can never repay him for his manifold blessings in our lives. Amen. Those received as well as those intended. Number two, we please God by our giving. Who do you want to please? I mean, we want to please our spouse, our moms, dads, sisters, brothers, best friends, neighbors, pastor, employer, and, you know, a lot of other people, too. But truthfully, there's only one person that will really ever need to be concerned about pleasing because God loves us. And he, well, when he is well pleased with us, we will find contentment in our lives. In Philippians 4.18 Philippians 4, verse 18, it says, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. They were well-pleasing to God. The offering that is well-pleasing to God is the one he tells us to give, and then we give it. Number three, your giving obligates God. To act on your behalf. Aha. Malachi 3.10 says that our giving tithes and offerings requires God to open the windows of heaven. We don't tithe and give offerings to windows of heaven are closed. But if we do tithe and give offerings, the windows of heaven are open. Let's see, open or closed, it's our choice. What we're really saying is the fact that God performs his word. Number four, number four, our giving just makes the enemy mad. You know, we often say we want to glorify God and terrify the enemy. Well, the enemy hates it when you sow because he knows that then you will reap a harvest. The enemy wants you to think that sowing is something that works for everybody else and not you. Isn't that just about the way he works? He wants us to believe that we will never receive our harvest. He knows if he can get you to kind of doubt and be disappointed, he can keep you from receiving your harvest and neutralize your financial effectiveness for the kingdom of God. The enemy creates false beliefs about money to rob you of your potential for success. Now let's pick up where we left off on yesterday's call. Number five, giving can be your way out of trouble. Hallelujah. You know the story of how Esau Gave up his birthright to Jacob for food. How Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, deceived Isaac into thinking Jacob was Esau. So he would bless him as the firstborn. When Esau discovered what Jacob had done, 
He was not a happy camper, no, as my wasn't. husband likes to say. Genesis 2741, 2741, reveals that Esau was going to kill Jacob after their father died. You know that Jacob got out of Dodge, to use a Western movie vernacular, and how he was deceived and taken advantage of by his father-in-law, Laban, for 20 years. However, during those years, he learned how to be blessed beyond measure. God directed Jacob to return home, even though he was now a wealthy man. Jacob was fearful how Esau, his brother, would react to the news of his return. Then Jacob prayed and asked God to save his hide. <laughs> You're into the Western today. I am. I am, baby. Which confirmed, which he confirmed he would do. The next morning, Jacob put together a pretty impressive gift of, well, animals, animals and, and other yeah. livestock and gifts for his brother Esau. Said the gifts him in three ways with a specific message to be given by Esau by his servants. When Jacob finally met Esau, there's a powerful message found in Genesis 33.10, 33, in the Message Bible. It says, Jacob said, please, if you can find it in your heart to welcome me, accept these gifts. When I saw your face, it was the face of God smiling on me. Accept the, accept the gifts I have brought for you. God has been good to me, and I have more than enough. Jacob urged the gifts on him, and Esau accepted. I love that, that next to last sentence. God has been good to me, and I have more than enough. That's a great confession that you should make every day. Father, I thank you that you've been good to me, and I have more than enough. Number six, our giving creates moments of unlimited blessings. King Solomon gave a spontaneous offering, which triggered a supernatural visitation and a blessing known throughout the ages. In 2 Chronicles 1 6, 2 Chronicles 1 6, it tells us about this. It says, And Solomon went up thither to the brazen altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of the congregation and offered a thousand burnt offerings upon it. This was no small offering. Other people were coming up and making their offerings, and Solomon comes up and offers a thousand burnt offerings. Solomon got the leaders together and said, Okay, the Spirit of God has moved me. You come with me, and I'm going to offer some burnt offerings to the Lord. He was moved by the Spirit. In the Dakes and it, and Annotated, annotated Bible. reference Bible in discussing the offering says it would be about three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars at that time. At that time, <laughs> that's not even at this time. But that's that's exactly that right. And that wasn't that would be a little <laughs> offering today, even at that amount. I know. And it moved the hand of God. You know, yes, if your if your offering moves you, then you know it moves God. That's right. The God of heaven came down to Solomon in a night vision immediately after he had given the offering. The spirit of the Lord prompted him to do. Ah, move God. He came to Solomon and said, Solomon, just ask what you want. What do you want me to do? When God comes and manifests himself, notice the humility of Solomon because Solomon begins not with answering the request. He begins by praising God. In 2 Chronicles 1, 8 through 10, 2 Chronicles 1, starting with verse 8, it says, And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established, for thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this, thy people, that is so great? You see, Solomon had already had some wisdom operating in his life to even be able to make a request like this. Because the Bible tells us in the book of, of Proverbs that wisdom will bring you riches and honor. And he had listened to his father. 
Solomon, at that point in his time and in his life, had enough wisdom to ask for wisdom. And in 2 Chronicles 1, verse 11 and 12, 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, it says, God replied to Solomon, because this was in your heart and you have not asked for riches, possessions, honor, and glory, or the life of your foes, or even for long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may rule and judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. And I will give you riches, possessions, honor, and glory, such as none of the kings had before you, and none after you shall have their equal. Hallelujah. Wow. What an attitude and a praise and humility before God. Look at what it can bring you. Number seven, giving creates conversation and change. When you give, God likes to brag about you, especially when your giving isn't, con- giving isn't convenient. Philippians 4, 14 and 15. Notwithstanding, let me say this again, Philippians 4, starting with verse 14 and 15. Notwithstanding, ye have well done, that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. The giving of the Macedonians, still speaking today. That's right. The alabaster box spoke to Christ and is still speaking to us today. Matthew twenty six thirteen, twenty six thirteen, classic amplified Bible. Truly I tell you. Wherever this good news, the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told also in memory of her. The giving of Cornelius was recognized in heaven and has been creating conversation about memorial giving through the ages. Amen. In Acts 10, 4, Acts 10, verse 4, classic amplified again, it says, And he, gazing intently at him, became frightened and said, what is it, Lord? And the angel said to him, Your prayers and your generous gifts to the poor have come up as a sacrifice to God and have been remembered by him. You know, honey, this list could go on and on, but time is running short. So we got one final scripture. Proverbs twenty four twelve. Twenty four twelve, New Living Translation. Don't excuse yourself by saying, Look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts, and he sees you. He who guards your soul knows you knew. He will repay all people as their actions deserve. Wow. Let's say that again. God will repay us as our actions deserve. So here's a question. That's it. When it comes to giving, what do our actions deserve? Mm. What do our actions deserve? The best way to do that is to be obedient to the voice of the Lord. Give when he says give, where he says give, how much he says give, however often he says to give. Do what he says. That's it. That's exactly right. Hallelujah. Go to HaroldHerring.com. Check out this week's two-minute video. You've been blessed by the teaching. Click the button that says soul seed. Just ask God what seed he'd have you put in the ground. Do what he says. That's all we ever ask. Let me say one other thing. Rich Thoughts for Breakfast, Volume 6, is almost complete. Wow. We should have it back from the printer in a couple of weeks. It's kind of exciting. And after that, we're going to do Volume 7 and Volume 8. So there are a few other things maybe in between. Well, God bless you. Listen. Hallelujah. I hate to hang up today, but I got to. Till tomorrow morning at 8.30 Eastern, God bless you. Happy trails. And keep thinking rich thoughts. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless you. Yes, we do. Bye-bye.